thank you. Well, my name is Ben Lüttiger. I'm working at the DH Zurich at the, in the IT services. And uh, this is one line that uh, contributes to my interests and my engagement. The other line is my scientific background. I first studied physics and after that I've studied cultural anthropology and after that I made a PhD in uh, business economics. My talk today is not a tech talk, not a technical talk. I never dare to hold such a presentation uh, on a Java conference, for example. But I've got the experience that the Python community is very open-minded and uh, that's the reason why I submitted this talk about uh, the political implications of having fun while programming open source. And uh, you voted for me and that's the reason why I'm here. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, Anna Ravencroft's uh, talk about diversity a lot. And I see this talk uh, kind of a completion in, in various aspects to Anna's uh, presentation. Some of you may have heard the presentation yesterday about uh, building complex web applications and having fun. And uh, also this talk is a kind of an add-on to that talk. Obviously, fun is an issue in the, in the Python community. Starting from oneself, from the ex experiences one has made, and the ideas one has developed is always a good, good idea. But then you have to pay attention not to generalize. You might, be, you might be very unique and then your ideas are not shared by anybody. Or you might be bloody normal and then your ideas are shared by everybody. But also something in between. To find out the correct numbers you have to make a research. That's what I've made. I've made the experience that I enjoy software de developing most of the time and always again. Therefore, I wondered whether this experience holds only for me or on the contrary is true for other people too. That's why I started my PhD research on motivations of open source programmers. My hypothesis was that fun is an important driver and may explain a lot of this interesting phenomenon. So what kind of fun are we talking about? I show you oops, a movie. Some of you <laughs> may have seen uh, this movie before. <laughs> enjoy it and then <laughs> yeah obviously this is kind of funny <laughs> but it's if you look at this uh, movie twice or more times uh, it's a superficial kind of fun it's a rather malicious pleasure on the shoulders of this poor man in the movie. And thinking about this movie twice, I think even the programmer that produced the software that drove the man in the movie so crazy, even this prog programmer didn't have much fun doing his work. So I rather have a different fun in mind when I talk about fun. It's a kind of fun the psychologist uh, Chikchen Mihai described as flow. And uh, the flow is constituted by five by six points according to the, his uh, research. The first is uh, concentration and focusing. That means a high degree of concentration on a limited field of attention. A person engaged in the activity that creates the flow experience will have the opportunity to focus and delve into it. Next, a loss of feeling of self-consciousness. This means 
that action and awareness are merged when you're in the flow state. Next, a distorted sense of time. That's what I experience all, all the time and I'm developing. That is the subje subjective experience of time is altered. You don't know how many hours passed while you've been in the flow state. Next, control and high level of absorption. You have a sense of full personal control over the situation and activity. The next point is also very important, clear goals and immediate feedback. You know what you have to do and when you have achieved it. If you failed, you can adjust your behavior as needed and immediately, and you can add a new iteration for, for, to, for that you can succeed and not stop the action with a, a frustration experience. Next point, the last point is the flow of actions. This means that each step leads fluently to the next as if the events are led by an inner logic. For that such a flow state can happen, such a flow experience, you need two important prerequisites that govern the situation. The first is attention focusing. The attention has to be focused on a limited field of stimulus. There must be no danger of distraction. And the second, more important point, there must be a balance between ability level and challenge. The perceived requirements have to be in balance with the person's ability level, whereas both requirements and the person's abilities have to be over average in the actor's view, in the subjective's view. Both two high challenges that lead to anxiety or two low challenges that lead to boredom will kill the flow experience and will lead to frustration instead. Based on uh, that understanding of fun, I've designed my study. I developed an online questionnaire with which, with which I've been able to measure <laughs> the software developers' engagement in open source projects depending upon their available time and depending upon fun while they are programming. So we have two input variables. The idea of this approach is to look at the variance of the dependent variable, in my case, the, the engagement in the open source projects, and to look how much this variance correlates with the input variables. And the statistical method to achieve this is called uh, regression analysis. I posted this questionnaire to the open source community in 2004, and I got a response rate of uh, 1,330 field forms. At the same time, I did an analogous questionnaire within six software companies in Switzerland, and uh, this yielded a response rate of 114 forms. So much for the study design. Here's the mathematical formulation of my hyp hypothesis I tried to test. The dependent variable engagement as function of uh, the programmer's fun and his available time. We need both of the independent variables because if you don't have available time, you can't do uh, an engagement in open source projects. So you need the, the time. And I've modeled uh, the equation with quadratic terms having negative sign in the quadratic term to express the diminishing marginal effect of an additional unit. With this model, I've been able to explain between 27 and 32 percent of the variance. That means my explanation is relevant, fun is relevant to explain the open source programmers engagement but it lets room for additional explanations of this phenomenon. An, ad an additional insight I got, if you look at the result table, there's no quadratic term of the uh, 
one variable. And that means that, means that one doesn't wear off. We don't have a, a, an additional unit of one is linearly transformed into, a, in, into engagement. That's for the basic results of my study. I've been able to create more insights looking at different subsamples. In my sam sample, I, got, I could identify a significant difference between hackers and professionals. And when I say about hackers, I mean developers who do open source programming mostly during their spare time. Whereas programmers, professionals, uh, developers who do open source programming mostly during at work and they are paid for their work. Uh, the difference I've identified is that hackers, hackers have more fun while programming. So this is quite of interesting. You may say uh, this is uh, not surprising. Uh, hackers, uh, open source developers have more fun as uh, commercial uh, programmers. But if you look at the activity, the activity software programming is the same. So what's the difference? The difference is in the context. Something in the context makes uh, less, the same activity less fun in, in the commercial context. And therefore, I looked at the uh, context and I was able to identify five traits where open source and commercial projects differ. When I talk about open source software here, I assume that the contributors have freely chosen to contribute to the, pro to the project and that they do their contribution in their spare time, the hacker's view. That given such open source projects usually have a project vision because that's the basis upon which the hacker, the open source contributor, chooses to engage in this project. And also such projects provide optimal challenge because the programmer, the hacker, contributes exactly what he's able to do and what he finds interesting. Because unless he's not a masochist, he will not do something he finds boring. At least, maybe, uh, software developers, uh, programming other uh, programming lang languages, but uh, for sure not uh, Python programmers, they know masochists. Such open source projects usually have no deadlines because you can't impose deadlines on projects where the contributors work uh, for the project in their spare time. Such projects don't have formal authority. Instead, authority is based on professional qualification. The projects don't offer monetary incentives that could institute, constitute formal authority. When you pay a software programmer for open or closed source projects, the projects you're in might or might not have a vision. For that uh, reason, I have a question mark in this column. The same holds for the optimal challenge they provide. You participate in the software project because you're paid to do so. The formal authority commands you to do so. My data allowed me to calculate correlations between the fun, the programmer's experience for the first four criteria. I could not calculate the effects of monetary incentives on fun. So, the correlation analysis I've made yielded the following result. I calculated highly significant correlations between project vision, between optimal challenge deadlines on the one side and fun on the other side. The existence or absence of formal authority didn't affect the fun experience that what these uh, numbers tell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's uh, what uh, uh, comes as a Surprise for me. 
I expected a negative sign, yeah, as you did. <laughs> but uh, my results uh, uh, say that the contrary is true. And that means the more deadlines you have in a commercial project, the more fun the programmers <laughs> experience in the process. <laughs> and that's very interesting because that means that deadlines are no fun killer. No. Or failing. <laughs> One of the reasons deadlines are great is if your project is lousy, it's really nice to know come August I won't have to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe at the end we can speculate about, about this result. Well, actually the deadline is very pointed with the, the challenge level. Yeah. I would agree with you, yes. Deadlines fit directly into game theory. Drive towards, so. Yeah, that was also one result I uh, remembered from the talk yesterday. They had tough deadlines, but uh, uh, they enjoyed nevertheless the project and had fun. So deadlines are no fun killer. And good project visions can be worked out under commercial conditions too, I, I think. The same holds for optimal challenge. If an employer knows both the project and the abilities of, your, of the employees, they can provide optimal challenges. But they have to do it. It doesn't come for free. Thus, I've proved that having fun while programming is not an experience that holds o only for open source developers. And that is not an experience uh, we have only during our spare time, but it's true for software developing in general. Programming can and should make fun, irrespective under what, irrespective whether this activity is done in an open source context or under professional conditions and in a commercial project. If you, in a real-life project, in real life, as prof professional software developer, experience less or no fun, there's something wrong with the employer, I think. He doesn't have an excuse, at least not on certain grounds. It's just not good enough. Yeah. So, the experience of fun while programming is an experience that can be generalized for the activity programming. We can conclude, thus, professional software developers have double rewards. The work as such is rewarding because we enjoy fun, plus the work is paid, which is a pleasant <laughs> experience <laughs> too. That leads to the following question. Are software developers privileged because they are rewarded twice? Or are there other work areas where people are rewarded both monetary and intrinsically because they enjoy the work they do? If the latter is true, this raises an interesting question. What does it imply if work is rewarding twice in general for a vari variety of work areas? Let's focus on this question for a while. When we look at how work is perceived, we can recognize two distinct and contradicting concepts. The first is work is compulsion. We must be set free from work. Wage is the compensation for suffering we experience at work. The second concept, which I'd like to promote, is uh, work is rewarding, because work is making fun. When we look at the political discussions in uh, modern societies, the first interpre interpretation is the dominant concept. There are parties in all modern societies and strong trade unions that do hard work to set us free from work. Concerning the other attitude, there's no party I know of that is committed to improve the quality of work we do. During the last 100 years, it was the main goal of leftist parties to support the improvement of the working condition of the workers in the industry and the employees in general. They have been very successful but during that time, the focus of this support shifted. 
This shift can be shown when we look at the mutation of the ID of the provisions for the old age. One of the biggest success of the leftist parties was the introduction of a system of provisions for the old age, of old age pension schemes. Pardon? Sorry, our chances were a bit. Yeah. Yeah. You're correct, correct historically. Thank you for the input. The original idea behind such schemes was to provide an income for the old in the times when they are not more employable, when they are too weak to work. And this basic idea is an idea of insurance, and this, of course, makes sense. But in the meantime, the insurance idea was abolished, and we have a pure pension scheme. You, you go into pension because you're old enough, not because you're not more able to work. Such a system makes perfect sense if you hate the work you do. But how is it when you love the work? But does it tell about a society if one of the most important fights of important players in the political arena is to set you free from work as soon as possible? Of course, such an understanding of the work has had its reasons. At the industrial times of the modern societies around one century ago, the work in the factories was between hard and horrible. Working in the factories meant being exploited for most of the time, the commitment of the labor unions and the leftist parties and of Bismarck for the workers was important and beneficial. But those times changed. If you look at the sectoral distribution of the gross national product, we see that the industrial sector only contributes a quarter. The most important sector, both if we look at the contribution of the gross national product and the number of persons working in is the service sector. This shift of importance concerning the sectors was accompanied by a shift of importance of education. Education became more and more important. The importance of both the third sector and education has gone up. In the in industrial times, the manual workers was the prototypical person in society. In the modern societies, it's the knowledge worker that has taken his place. I've copied the Wikipedia definition of the term knowledge economy. According to this definition, knowledge economy is a concept that supports the creation of knowledge by the employees in a company. The aspect that the knowledge created by the employees has to be in line with the company's goals is very important, I think. Let's approach the fact that we live in a knowledge society and that we work in a knowledge economy by putting us into the view of an employer. What does this fact mean for an employer? We assume a rational employer. That means at the end of the day he wants to have a profit. In a correctly institutional economy, he does this by selling products or services to customers. Because he can't do this all alone, he needs employees. As soon as he has employees, he runs into a problem economical scientists call the principal agent problem. The owner, that is the principal, and his employees, the agents, have different goals. The company is successful only if it manages to bring the employees' goals in line with the company's goals. Basically, the employee can exert two different concepts to achieve this, control or loyalty. This is true for all societies with division of labor, I think. During the high times of industrialization, when most of the employees worked in factories and at assembly lines, control was the obvious choice. At the assembly line, you're almost automatically in line with the company's goals. But where are the assembly lines in the knowledge economy? In the knowledge economy, the determining factor is not what the employee achieves compared to predefined goals and plans. In the knowledge economy, there are hardy plans whose fulfillment can be measured by quantitative 
means. Predefined work can be handled by machines, by robots. They're much better suited to do such work because they're much more efficient to do such work. When it comes to human work, it's much better when we let humans work in a flexible, in an uncontrolled context where the fulfillment of the task depends upon the employee's creativity and ingenuity. The employee's ability to act and react in unplanned and unfamiliar, unfamiliar situations is a central success factor, especially if the company acts in highly competitive areas. These are the employees which contribute to the company's advance and make it distinguishable from the competitors. It was Peter Drucker who first introduced the term knowledge economy. The Wall Street Journal labeled him as the dean of the US business and management philosophers. If you look through the management literature he wrote, you won't find anything about how to control the employees. Instead, you find lots of thorough insights about how to motivate the employees, how to leverage their potential. The quotes I've taken from him, the two quotes, prove that he was perfectly aware of the importance of challenge and fun to motivate the employees. The, quote, the first quote, to make high demands based on the person's strengths, that's and uh, nothing other than to provide challenge. And the second quote is about fun and its effects on the climate within the company. Raka didn't work for companies whose employees didn't enjoy the work. He didn't this because he simply couldn't get somewhere with such companies. There's another fine quote I copied. It's from another psychologist with Spillow into the management literature. It's from Chikchen Mihai, which invented the flow concept. He, dis who discover he discovered the flow, co flow phenomenon. And of course, he, were, he was aware of the fun and happiness. He was aware that fun and happiness is not only a matter of scientific research, but of economic and social practice too. But unfortunately, these findings didn't make it really into the managers' heads, I think. That's at least what the yearly Gallup studies uh, show us. Gallup, the Gallup Institute makes uh, since uh, 10 years uh, an engagement index and the last year's results about Germany yielded the following data. Only 13% of the employees have high emotional binding to the company. 21% of the employees have no bindings at all. They behave destructive at the workplace. They show no personal engagement. Instead, they do work to do. The absent time of such employees is 28% higher than those of their colleagues. They don't contribute any ideas to the company and 59% of them plan to leave the company within a year. Most, the most frequent substantiation of such behavior is, according to Gallup, the missing attention of and recognition of the superiors. The employees don't find themselves sufficiently promoted and uh, and the employee's opinion is not appreciated. And this is exactly the contrary of what Drucker and Chikchen Mihai promoted. Poorly motivated employees cause significant costs. For Germany, the Gallup Institute instituted uh, estimated costs of 126 billion euro per year. Let's dig uh, deeper into the concept of loyalty. To fully understand the meaning of the term loyalty, it's worth to look at the alternate alternatives. In 1970, the economist Albert Hirschman came up with a very influential concept that explained that he explained using the three terms exit, voice, and loyalty. These three terms 
describe on the most generic level the basic interactions of an individual vis-a-vis -vis the organization, organization or company he's in. If the organization is a company, the in individuals may be customers or employees. In the political area, the individuals are citizens or inhabitants. The terms describe different interaction channels that transmit information of possibly different kind and of different strength. An organization that has to orient on the needs of the individuals, for example, on the needs of customers, will seek for the signals sent through these channels. The more dynamic an organization is, the better it is in deciphering these signals and the sooner it is able to adapt. Exit is the channel through which the weakest signals are sent, but at the same time, exit is a method causing the biggest costs. If a company loses customers, the company has to find new customers, and this is costly. In an undemocratic state, if uh, this state loses citizens, it has to pull up walls on the borders, and this causes heavy costs on various levels. Aside of the obvious, the, ex the physical exit, there's the exit in the inner emigration. Employees with no emo emotional binding on the company will either leave the company or do work to rule and will be absent whenever possible. An organization that is aware of the exit option will try to make the voice option as easy and attractive as possible. If an unsatisfied customer complains in, instead of exiting silently, he provides valuable information to the company. An attentive company will adapt as soon as possible and thus preventing the silent loss of many other customers. And the same holds for a critical employee too. They provide very valuable information to the company, to the attentive company. The loyal individual is providing the most value for the organization. He is in, in line with the goals of the organization without control. The employee, the employer can't command loyalty and he can't buy loyalty only by giving the salary. Salary is important. Salary is related to the contractual level. Workforce is exchanged for salary. You work and you get paid. But when it comes to loyalty, it's, it's more than contractual. It's a different level. It's an exchange too. The employee gives his loyalty if the, empl if the employer gives him the possibility to evolve his potential in return. For that, the employer can evolve the employee's potential. He has to be aware of this potential. He has to offer the challenges and he has to offer a direction. And this is exactly the conditions that make that the employee enjoys the work he does. At least according to my study of about the motivations of open source programmers. And at the same time, these are the means to bring the employee in line with the organizational goals. Of course, all these considerations make sense only for the individuals and organizations in a knowledge economy and a knowledge society. So I finished my reflections and I can recapitulate. Because of the division of labor and because of the knowledge economy, the employer has to bring the employees in line with the organizational goals. The employer can either control or he can trust on the employee's loyalty. When you control, you get what you see, but that's probably not what you want. In particular, you don't get anything surprising or innovative. But in the knowledge economy, companies have to be innovative. Therefore, companies do better if they seek the employers for the employees' loyalty. The employees are willing to give their loyalty in exchange for the employer's willingness to evolve their potential. An employee can evolve the potential to the, the employees present if he's aware of the strengths of the employees, if he esteems the work the employees does, if he provides a vision of the company the employee works in, 
and if he provides challenging objectives the employees have to achieve. Under such conditions, the employee is both in line with the company's goals and he has fun doing the work he does. With his work, he creates valuable goods and thus he provides to the employer's profit. Thus, I've proved that fun is by no means a privilege of open source programmers nor of software developers in general, but it's a common feature of work in the knowledge economy and knowledge society. Now, what are the political implications of that fact, of the fact that work can and should be fun for all? One is obvious. The leftist battle cry, let's get rid of work, has become kind of obsolete. What really matters now is to get freedom at work. We should ask for political organizations that, that commit to the quality of work. If we care for the quality of work, on the same time, we have to insist on the value that is created through work. We have to insist, we have to appreciate that the value that is created through work. Consumption, that is okay, but creation is better. If we scorn the values created by work, we hardly can, can't appreciate work as such. Some people claim that because of technologi technological advances, work will run out. So why bother about the quality of work if there's no le work left over? But I don't agree with such ideas. We don't have to worry that work could run out. The services sector's potential to create work is unlimited, I think. Many companies still did not get the lesson and they provide poor work and poor workplaces for their employees. At least that's what the yearly Gallup studies show. So what can we do to achieve an economy that provides work for all that is fun to do? I am convinced that bad companies cannot survive in the long because, as Drucker pointed it out, bad companies produce mean quality. Therefore, stiff competition in the market is good because it drives the bad companies out of the market as soon as possible. So that, can, they, that such companies can be replaced by better ones, by companies that provide good working places. However, there's an important social prerequisite. We have to make all individuals fit for the knowledge economy. Education is the key factor to achieve this. I am convinced that having fun while working is not only good for the individual, and it's by no means an end, it, it, in, it, it, an end in itself. In contrary, it's good for the society as a whole because if a society succeeds to make work enjoyable for all, such a society will be more dynamic and capable of solving the upcoming social problems. And there are plenty of them at any time. So I hope you agree with, my, with me and share this view. And I thank you for attending. Uh, just out of interest, um, did you ask about the the operating system the software developers <laughs> were working on, were there Windows companies doing commercial development and did they have also such much fun? <laughs> no, uh, I don't have data correlated with uh, operating system, so I can't say something about this. So your analysis is based on comparing open source software around the world to commercial software developed in Switzerland. You have several confounding factors there. So for instance, you have open source software development like Python, where Guido is sponsored by Google to do development, which is doing open source software at a company as compared to commercial proprietary. Another confounding factor, of course, is that you have Switzerland. What, which of the open source fact, what is the correlation between the open source projects primarily developed in Switzerland versus Switzerland? And a third confounding factor you have, you can look at deadlines, is that a number of projects, including Python, have deadlines. Python has published deadlines. Ubuntu has regular cadences for cycles. So you can look at the correlation 
just inside the open source projects without doing the analysis, without, sorry, without doing the confounding effects of commercial inside of Switzerland. What is the results of that analysis and how does that affect your conclusions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have uh, been able to uh, do this, those subsamples not only. Uh, uh, I have to uh, tell you so. Uh, I did not compare for uh, this uh, difference uh, concerning uh, deadlines and having fun uh, by comparing uh, this, the uh, responses. Uh, I got that through the uh, commercial companies in Switzerland. Uh, luckily, I've been able to do within the responses I've gathered through the open uh, source questionnaire uh, to uh, make uh, the, those two subsamples. And for that, I could uh, compare uh, uh, these subsamples and so uh, therefore, I was, have been able to uh, um, make these uh, conclusions concerning deadlines. So it's not a comparison between uh, the responses gathered through the company uh, uh, questionnaire, but within the open source questionnaire. Yeah. I have one question about how societies could deal with those people who are biologically or by early social conditioning not able to take part in the knowledge economy, who are simply not bright enough to take part in the <laughs> knowledge economy. Yeah, that's uh, of course that's a uh, a problem. Such a uh, Analysis doesn't fit for 100 percent, and uh, but I think uh, if a comp uh, if a society is dynamic, if it can produce welfare, then uh, we can also be aware of uh, those five, ten percent that uh, don't fit, and. Uh, if uh, society is dynamic, maybe uh, we can uh, provide uh, tools to improve the situation also for, for these uh, uh, leftovers, for these uh, five, ten percent. I'm very uh, optimistic about that. Not, not all service knowledge economy. I mean, the are part of the service industry, are, don't have to be... You have to be very bright to take care of my car. You get fried. Yeah, the, the, the being bright and wanting to do the high-tech kind of knowledge economy stuff, um, the service industry includes other kinds of... Uh, abilities and skills, including people who are smart enough to figure out your car uh, and uh, people who are able to cook wonderful food and things like that are also service and uh, also can have fun in their work. So, so there's a recent buzzword trend of gamification of work uh, where you basically take a Farmville-like game of that's compulsive like checking email and you turn it in gold at uh, elements of massive multiplayer role playing strategy um, so at that point you basically can take an old school company uh, that's repetitive mind uh, dumping work make it a game it's not personally satisfying but it's like crack you just, <laughs> you just keep clicking keep checking stuff so um, so you, so this is basically industry's response on your thoughts on that we need to have more engaged users. 
Um, and maybe you can comment further on this perspective. Um, can you repeat the, the first part of your I didn't get it fully, the, the, the description. So gamification, right? Um, no. Turning it into games. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Or game-like game interface. But uh, you said that it's not so funny, not so enjoy enjoyable. I think game is very... So, um, <laughs> so um, how many times do you they check your email? So if you're more like us, you would check email every five minutes and then you check slash dot and read it. And um, so <laughs> research on uh, the way brain work is that every time there's a new um, story on slash dot, you get like a small uh, chemical reaction, which is essentially the same as, you know, getting drugs. Um, so, um, but the trick is that e even like in gambling, when you roll the dice, it's the happiness of getting a chance of being, like, of being uh, successful. Um, and if you turn that into a Farmville game and everything that's popular on Facebook today, or even you know, World of Warcraft, uh, you can explore the same mechanics and get uh, like, you know, tower defense games and anything. Just things that you click for hours and you feel lousy, but you still click. Um, and so there's like a, a, a whole body of knowledge that where basically you take a security guard and you have them, you know, f you using computer graphics to insert bad guys into their screens to keep them alert and to give them something to work. Um, so they essentially play World of Warcraft whole day watching the monitors where otherwise they would be falling asleep. Um, and that way you get... Um, yeah, you get better performance. You can give them virtual gold. You can give them guilds. They compete to other uh, security guides. I'm not saying it's right, but it's something that industry is moving towards. Yeah, it's an interesting. Sorry, yeah, it doesn't give happiness. So it's not exactly fa fun. And I also have um, well, two comments. Uh, one is that. Uh, you sort of assume there's a fit between my um, interests and talents and market, which I think is not necessarily widely true. And the other comment would be that uh, I somehow doubt that move of um, manufacturing to China has to do something with China workers being happier at what they do. So um, just assuming that uh, competition would lead to a uh, happier workforce is kind of tensious. Yeah, that's a, a good point. But I think it's a, a stepwise approach. Uh, I think uh, it, yeah, in the, in the uh, markets of the uh, developed countries, uh, they are outsourcing the uh, assembly lines to China and then to Vietnam and uh, poor countries. But, but on the same time, uh, they create wealth in these countries. And it's the hope uh, that uh, if uh, there's more wealth, they can, uh, and at the end, they have to provide uh, uh, work for, for these people too that make fun that it is uh, enjoyable. But uh, for the moment, uh, of course, that, uh, that's right. The poor work is outsourced to such countries. Uh, I will, uh, about the challenging part, to make it something challenging, it means intrinsically that I will eventually fail. If it's, I'm not going to fail sometimes, it's not a real challenge for me. And uh, you can see it at all the scale in the sense that uh, uh, you can fail in uh, making the software right the first time and then you can fix the bug. And this is very particular of the software environment. You cannot uh, fix after driving the bus. Uh, you try to turn better this time, <laughs> and <laughs> challenging your last goal. <laughs> It's not exactly applicable in uh, this type of fields. 
the sense that making people fun using challenging is applicable only when failure is okay. Yeah, that's uh, of course that's true. But I think uh, this uh, interpretation holds not only for the software industry, but uh, for a various uh, other uh, aspect of the service sector. But of course, uh, uh, in a the, uh, in the Gesundheit sector, what's the term? In? The health sector, yeah. <laughs> if the, uh, the medicines has to operate on a human body, they, there's <laughs> no such thing as a failure, uh, the failure possibility. <laughs> but you cannot the bug after. You cannot wake up one night, oh shit, <laughs> and well, solve it's, the problem. It's it. I wanted to ask a different question, but it's interesting. You're talking about bus driving. The people, I think, in Stockholm, but I'm not sure which city in Sweden, not the one that I live in, uh, thought the bus drivers were not driving properly, so they installed um, things that looked like paintbrushes on the outside of the buses, so, and then they had other sensors on the street corners, so they could measure how close to the corners they were doing to see whether they were... Uh, um, the problem they were complaining, people were complaining about was the bus was too far away from the curb, so the old people had a hard time getting on the bus. And then they could measure it, and they could fail, and it was safe, so you could even do it for buses. Um, <laughs> well, the they question, have bus rodeos. They have bus driver rodeos where they do this exact oh, sort of thing. Cool. Yeah. I had no idea. Anyway, I the but the question I want to know is, is this, is this all self-selected sets? Were they all volunteers who chose to talk to you? Or when you went to the companies, how did you get this, your data? Was it all, did the people who talked to you select themselves to, yeah. to talk to you? Or did you sort of go out and, no, and randomly right. sample people and say, you must give me the answers? <laughs> no, there's a problem when, you, when you're doing a survey about anything and you get the self-selected set, because the people who want to talk to you generally are the people who really love what love what they're doing and they want to talk to you about it because they think it's great, or the people who are really, really unhappy about it and, yeah. and they want to bitch to you about how rotten everything is, but the people in between, I'm too busy, I'm not going to do any of this. So I'm wondering, you know, how widely can you generalize this if it's just the self-selected set? I mean... No, yeah, you're true. That's a, a flaw of my study. It was a purely self-selected sample. Uh, online questioning in both samples, the commercial so and the open source. Both were self selected, Exactly. Yeah. Selected by the boss. Uh, yeah. Do, do, do they have basic stuff anywhere, like frequencies and cross channels? Yeah, on my table, yeah. Okay. And on, on my data, if you're interested, I could give you the, the data. data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> I wanted to very specifically challenge uh, the software versus health industry distinction about which jobs can be challenging. There are jobs in, for example, oncology. You can play it safe and your patient with advanced metastatic cancer will be 99.97% certain to die according to proper accepted procedure or you can take a risk. Actually, you can't decide to, but the patients who are nearly certain to die will desperately queue to sign up to experimental things where they're 99 certain to die, 99%, which is much better than by no running risk. On the other hand, when you write the software that controls the amount of radiation that is coming out of that uh, uh, radiotherapy machine, that the oncologist may be using in a certain context, your mistake is just as bad as the mistake of the oncologist. There isn't a sharp line. There are a few spots in healthcare where risk is a must, and a few spots in software where risk is absolutely out of the question. So I don't think there's such sharp lines. Bus, bus driving is 
an example where I cannot actually think of a situation where risk is better, but actually driving anything, occasionally you find yourself in situations where like an invisible patch of black ice on the street hits you, uh, playing it safe means crashing for certain. And so the risk may be acceptable. But it's not something you plan in advance. Ooh, let's put some b patches of black ice just to make things challenging. So it's a very different situation, all I'm saying. I want to thank you for making such a good case for companies adopting an agile mindset. Um, but I also want to point out that um, Shik sent me highly in his research um, says that people are often totally unaware that they are in a state of flow. So he has a very special study design that accommodates for that. And he also finds that um, the state of flow is not something that is hard to reach in work and that there is, that is not, uh, flow is not dependent on education at all. Yeah. So, um, why do you come to these con conclusions that education is key? My approach was that uh, so your question was uh, why uh, to combine flow state with uh, education. And my approach was uh, education is important in the knowledge society and the knowledge society is the society most of us live in compared to the situation 100 years before. And the, the important thing is uh, the, uh, the principal agent problem. The, in an economy with division of labor, there's the employer and on the other side the employees and the employee has to bring the employees in line with the, with the company's goals. And 100 years ago, he could achieve this using the assembly line, using the control. And in the knowledge economy, I think I'm confident that this is not more true. Instead, he has to bring the employees in line through loyalty and where does education come into this and uh, loyalty uh, he, he, it, it's an exchange uh, uh, the employer the employees are willing to give uh, loyalty if they get some kind of fun in return and trust what you want to give your employees for example rather than education? I can't hear you. Isn't it rather stuff like trust you give your uh, employees that gets them motivated rather than stuff, of, uh, stuff like education? The, the education comes in because of the, of the knowledge economy. You only contribute, you're only in the knowledge economy because you're educated, you need a, a yeah, some kind uh, more and more education to that for that you can contribute, and uh, these contributions are needed because knowledge, the players in the knowledge economy needs innovation. You need to be you know, the high level healing spells to get in the fun rates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so based on your conclusions, um, there would could be a possible follow-up research where you take a look at the open source uh, projects and see how they structure their tasks. If they're, uh, so what's, how clearly they, they have goals and deadlines and release cycles and goals for those release cycles, how they structure single tasks so to give easier access and then compare that to the number of commits or contributions, messages to mailing list, uh, average time to answer the ticket, um, and, and run that across, I don't know, let's say popular Python web frameworks, and see how, because you know, have nice five years of data, and you could get probably some good meta-analysis on top of that. Yeah. That would be, of course, would be very, very interesting, but uh, not 
working at a research institute instead I'm working at the uh, services department I'm software de developer I like this work and unfortunately I am not uh, at the moment in a position to do research but uh, if uh, some institutions or somebody here is in a position to do such uh, work uh, I can uh, contribute my experience and my data set and uh, of course I would love to see uh, such uh, uh, results of a, an additional follow-up study. <clears throat> Late, uh, early on in the presentation you sort of uh, discussed the fact that a, tr a traditional left-wing um, platform was that abolishing work and you instead were making the case for making work more fun. But I think, uh, I'm not a Marxist by any stretch, but I've read Capital, and one of the points that Marx makes is that one of his criticism of capitalism is that workers are alienated from work. And I think a lot of your analysis fits into that, which is, you know, in some sectors, I think you can make the case that workers have fun and, can, and have a stake in what they do, and, and I think your analysis is very on point to that. But in uh, other... Uh, sectors which are not in the knowledge economy and which it's hard to imagine making them fun. I mean, a lot of the things that we use as uh, technology users, uh, iPads were made in a factory in China that had a suicide rate that was ridiculously high because workers were being made to work 24 hours a day. So I don't think the workers there are having fun. It's They are working there because it's cheap and the Chinese government doesn't crack down on certain working practices. So how do you see that extending, I mean, so that all work becomes fun and not just, you know, for us privileged programmers that get to do really interesting stuff? Yeah, that's a good point. I think maybe that's only a perspective, but uh, if you look at the historical data of the modern societies, we see in all modern societies that the, the, the third sector increased uh, its contribution to gross national product that more and more uh, people are employed in the third sector and I think and that there are um, uh, various uh, signs that uh, the same uh, steps are uh, uh, same perspective is uh, holds only for holds also for for, uh, for China, for the uh, developing countries. But of course, that's, uh, that's the future. And, uh, but that's my, my hope that uh, those uh, economies will uh, evolve uh, uh, in an analogous way as uh, we have seen in the, uh, in the industrial, industrialized, in the developed countries. And maybe this... Uh, uh, evolution will be far faster than uh, for us in the last centuries. And uh, this is, of course, the, the hope that uh, this uh, uh, evolution uh, will, will proceed uh, faster in, 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 in the nowadays evolving countries. And, yeah, at the, the moment we have a, a separation between uh, the, the wealthy countries, the wealthy, wealth, welfare economies on the one side and uh, 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 many uh, countries, uh, many economies uh, with uh, the classical industrial uh, outlook, yeah. But the world is changing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's time for food. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the uh, talk time is over. We should thank Banno. Thank <laughs> you.